Okay guys, in this video segment we're going to talk about solubility and how solubility can relate back to saturation for our solution. So, how much solute can you dissolve? Now when we talk about the amount of solute, what we work with is the term solubility. Okay, Solubility is much like density or a specific heat capacity or boiling point, melting point. It's a number. It's an actual quantitative value that we can use. Uh, so the solubility of something can be measured and then we can use that to actually get information about that chemical. So when you deal with solubility, we actually have a large range of different solubilities for different solutes. Okay, So the solubility is based on the solute being dissolved into your solvent. And typically our solvent here is water. The terms that we use are soluble, insoluble, miscible, or immiscible. Okay, soluble and insoluble are basically talking about solid or gas solutes in terms of will they dissolve or will they not dissolve into your solvent. Miscible and immiscible means will your liquid solute dissolve or not dissolve into your solvent. Now typically our solvent here again is water, but it can be anything in terms of our solvents. Um, now it is temperature dependent. So as temperature changes, the solubility changes, okay, and we'll actually track that in our next couple of slides. And then for gas solutes only, it's also dependent on pressure, okay? So make a special note of that, that if you're dealing with pressure changes, it only affects a gas solute. So carbon dioxide in water, or oxygen in water, or nitrogen in water, it would not affect anything that's a solid, like sodium chloride, or ethanol, or sugars. Those would not be affected by differences in pressure. Okay, let's take a second here and jump it into this little application. What this little applet allows us to do is actually take a look at the numbers for solubility of a lot of different chemicals together. So here we have ammonium nitrate, and we see our solubility is a, is 1180 grams per liter, which means we can dissolve 100 or 1,180 grams in a liter's worth of solution. So that's a pretty high solubility. Um, if we move over to something like uh, silver nitrate we see a pretty big number again because nitrates we know are very soluble if you think back to our other units on solubility. So nitrates are very soluble. However, chlorides tend to be less soluble than nitrates. So if you, if you look with silver chloride, we only get a solubility of 0 0.0018. So that number is much smaller, but some does dissolve. You go to silver phosphate, for example, 0 0.065. If you go to zinc phosphate, as far as we know, nothing dissolves. If you go to lead phosphate, we get 1.4 times 10 to the negative 4 grams per liter. Okay, so we're talking about very, very small amounts of that dissolving now. If you go to lead chromate, lead sulfate, oh, lead hydroxide, lead oxide, so leads are not very soluble. Uh, let's try calcium. Calcium oxide, about 1.3. Uh, calcium iodide, wow, 2,000 grams per liter. So that's a, that's a really soluble substance there, okay? If you take a look, these are all different numbers. But every compound as a solute has its own value to it. So you actually can calculate and determine how much can you dissolve into your solution. Now keep in mind, this table is probably set at a very set temperature. Typically, we set our temperature at 20 degrees Celsius or 25 degrees Celsius, which are our numbers close to room temperature. So these values in here would be different if we warmed something up or cooled something down. Okay. Now if we go back to our presentation and we talk about how our changes happen with, with solubility, we're first going to tackle pressure. Okay, so pressure changes affecting solubility. Now again, this only affects gases, okay? So make a note of that. We're only talking about gas solutes here. And what we found out is that as you change pressure, the solubility of a gas is directly proportional to the pressure above the solution. So if I had something at atmospheric pressure, and I had, let's say, 2 grams of oxygen dissolved in a liter of water, if I doubled that pressure, that would double to 4 grams. If I doubled it again, it would double to 8 grams. So we have a direct proportionality here. If you graph this, we see that as you move up from pressure of 1 atmosphere to 2, that these linear regressions show a doubling effect, or we see this direct relationship. Now, this relationship we call Henry's Law. And what Henry's Law is really just telling us is that there is this correlation between the pressure if above a solution and the solubility of the gas. Here's a video on Henry's Law. The solubility of a gas in any solvent is proportional to the pressure of the gas over the liquid. Here we see a gas in equilibrium between the liquid and gas phases.
When the gas is compressed, the solubility of the gas in the liquid phase increases in proportion to the increased pressure. The relationship between gas pressure and solubility is known as Henry's Law. Okay, so the little animation just kind of gives you an idea of why this works. If you put a lot more pressure above the solution, you have so many more particles in a smaller space that more of them migrate into that solution instead. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio there. So if you double the pressure, you double the effect of solubility in that solution. Now moving on to temperature, again, we're only going to talk about gas solutes for our first slide because what, what gases do is different than what solids and liquids do. So for gas solutes, as you increase the temperature, the solubility actually goes down. Okay. Now that might be counterintuitive to what you would think would ha happen because people tend to think that increasing temperature makes things more soluble. And normally it does, but most of the things that we have examples of or think about in our daily lives are solids and liquid solutes, which they're going to be the opposite effect here. For gases, you can imagine a gas is a higher energy state. So if that gaseous particle in solution is already at a higher energy state, if we start to heat that gas up, well, that gas is in solution. If you heat it up, it's more likely to leave the solution than stay inside there because you're giving it extra energy. So gases tend to decrease as you, in, in, as you um, warm them up. Now this can have some repercussions because if we have, if we're using river water or lake water um, to cool down factories and plants and power plants and that kind of stuff, if we pump the river water into the factory, cool down whatever we need to cool down in there and then pump that water directly back out into the river even though we may not have had the water contaminated with any chemicals just by having a warmer water being put into the river can change your oxygen levels. Well, if you change the oxygen levels that can change the type of fish that thrive in that area or that can change the type of plant species that thrive in that area. So you know thermal pollution does exist and they do things to stop that. Um, if you've ever noticed going up Highway 77 towards the Mall of America, off to the west side or the left side if you're heading north, or the right side if you're heading south away from the mall, um, you see a gigantic kind of pond out there, and there's a power plant down in there. Well, that pond is a holding pond. What it's used for is when the power plant draws water out of the Minnesota River, they use that to cool the plant, and then that water's hotter than it needs should be now, so instead of dumping it directly back in the river, they dump it into this kind of man-made pond, let it re-establish the correct temperature of the environment around it, and then the, as that water leaks back into the river, it goes back in at the correct temperature. So it's a way to avoid some thermal pollution by using that water, which is kind of a good idea. You know it exists that way because if you drive by in the middle of winter, a lot of times that water will still be open and not frozen over, which the rest of our area is. Well, it's not frozen over because they keep adding hot water to it um, year-round. Okay. Now, if we move on to temperature affecting solubility of a solid or liquid solute, so now we're talking the opposite, or solids and liquids. In this case, as temperature goes up, it follows a pattern that you would expect. You see that most of our chemicals here increase solubility as it gets warmer, which you would expect. Um, if you think about this process, now you're trying to get something like a solid to stay in solution. So solids typically are lower energy state. So to keep them from re-solidifying or recrystallizing, the more temperature we give them, the better they stay in their solution. And the same thing for liquids. So if you notice, most of our solids are going to increase in solubility over time. You do notice that there are some exceptions to this. So the cerium sulfate down here, it actually decreases and then kind of flatlines. Well, with cerium sulfate, as you warm it up, its crystal lattice actually kind of becomes stronger, or it makes it harder for the crystals to be broken off or to be dissolved. So it's an exception. It's not an exception I need you guys to remember or memorize or do much more with, but just realize that there are some exceptions out there for these general trends that are on there. Okay. Now, that ends the slide for today. Uh, if you go on to our next video slide, it'll be about calculating these concentrations um, in solution using molarity. Thank you.